Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Mortgage Heroes Weekly Podcast. I'm Andy. I'm Brian. Today, Brian and I are going to go over four industry articles. We have a lot of Gen Z and millennials to talk about. Again, it seems to be like a recurring topic, but actually a new part of the economy and new survey results. This is very fascinating. So we're going to go to it right away today. Uh, Number one, we have housing affordability is Gen Z's top voting issue outweighing other... (laughs) Other major topics, such as abortion rights, the economy, gun rights, preserving democracy, immigration, foreign wars and geopolitical conflicts, student debt. Holy crap. What the heck? I loved it. I was actually really surprised. Not surprised, but I was actually happy to see this. I was surprised. I, I was happy to see it because I feel that... The one thing we can all agree on is that the economy needs some work. And the rent is too damn high. Everything's so expensive, whether you're buying or you're renting. Things are expensive. The rent is too damn high. And, and <laughs> you know, what I notice is that the biggest things that the media highlights or in general that are, you know, being pushed as the most important or most, like, you know, crucial are, in fact, as you can see, like, people's less worries. So so what Brian's referring to here is in the Gen Z column, a ranking from number one to number nine. Number one is housing affordability. Number nine is foreign wars and geopolitical conflicts, which is funny because, yeah, on the media right now, you think it's all it's all Palestine and Israel, and it's, it's all about that. And then, okay, uh, student debt is another big one, immigration. So that's like seven, eight, and nine. Immigration, student debt, and foreign wars. Now, here's what's interesting. Here's the pattern in this, is as you go from Gen Z to millennials to Gen X to baby boomers, the housing affordability... Uh, uh, ranking goes down. So in order, Gen Z, house says housing affordability, number one. Millennials, housing affordability, number three. Gen X, housing affordability, number four. four. Baby boomers, housing affordability, number six. I but mean, it makes- check this out. Right after Gen Z says if housing affordability is number one, number two is the economy. And look at every other column. Millennial, number one, what is it? Uh, economy. What is Gen X number economy. one? What is Baby Boomer number one? Economy. Economy. So here's my point. Regardless of housing affordability as a standalone topic being, let's say, like less and less important the older and older the generations yeah. go, at least yeah. on this chart, you know what's in the top two of every single person's? The uh, economy. <laughs> and it's number one for millennials, Gen X, and Baby Boomers. And I would argue, too, that the housing affordability is a reflection of the overall economy itself as right. you are looking to qualify and you have, you know, your income is whatever it is and you're trying to get into a home and be able to purchase and pricing is where it's at with home prices and rates are higher higher than they have relatively to, to been to, to his, his, the history here recently. Um, I'm going to quote someone that most people my age know, uh, James Carville. When he said, it's the economy, stupid. That's what people care about. The economy is what happens to their life personally at the individual level. And then that spills over into all the other things. A hundred percent. Like if you don't have that, then a lot of the other things don't really, not that they don't matter is that they don't fall into place the way that they should, because that's the force of like driving everything. And now everything else falls under that. So if we can't continue to, you know, worry about what moves the needle down the line for all these families, then a lot of the other things, you know, I won't say is irrelevant because they are important. They are something that, you know, we do need to pay attention to, but, but at the same time, there's things that our people here in the United States are saying, hey, this is the most important thing. Yep. This is the most crucial thing. And from what I see and what I notice, it, it isn't something that gets, you know, given the attention that it needs to be given. Well, it, it, there, and, well, there's there's a reason. I would argue that right now there's a reason. They don't want people They don't want people to, t- to be pointing the finger at them right now. Yeah. At the current administration, at least, and saying, oh, the economy, the economy, the economy, right? Um, and again, just so you know, James Carville, he was the, um, he, he's the one who said that the economy is stupid back in like 1992. Mm. This is when like Bill Clinton was, uh, was, was going up against like George W. Bush uh, for the presidential election. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, no, you don't. It was 1992. It was way before you. Uh, but the point is, his whole thing was like, it's the economy, stupid. People care about the economy. It's like yeah. the proximity to their daily life, the things that are yeah. important to them that's impacting them day in, day out. Um, that's what's most important. And here, what you see in the survey is it's clearly the most important thing for millennials, Gen X, and baby boomers. It's number two for Gen Z. Now, you mentioned foreign wars earlier. In, in a similar way, has you kind of like a, a, an es- a, kind of a, a, a de-escalating rate of importance for housing? As you go from Gen Z to baby boomer, you see an increase of the foreign wars importance. So for for Gen Z, where foreign war is number nine, and then millennials, it's number seven, and then Gen X is number six, and then baby boomer number four. So that's also very interesting because this is something where, again, to this, this whole point of like, it does this matter to me right now? Does this affect my own backyard, my own front door, my job, my commute, my kids, my life, my future? You see the trend 
way different when it comes to this. So no, I 100% I think inversely, the baby boomers had a bigger impact in foreign wars and geopolitical uh, geopolitical conflicts in their life back then. I feel that yeah. they have now. Whereas mm-hmm. now it's like we didn't really grow up through much wars until I was recent that you know all the scandals was happening with Ukraine, with uh, you know Russia, with uh, you know uh, Middle East and all that. It's only very recent that some of our younger generation is starting to experience that. Whereas the <clears throat> older generation had, you know, few wars going into the, you know, into their into the years growing up. And I think that that that's a huge correlation mm-hmm. because of the fact that for them it's more important. But for us, it's like, yo, like we we just know what's happening right now. We haven't really experienced much wartime or conflicts like this. So how do we just focus on what's gonna keep moving us to where we wanna be? Yeah, it's, it definitely is is less relevant than it was for the older generations. I think that has a lot to do with you know the lived experience of what you know through through geopolitical conflicts. Yes, number one, absolutely. Uh, also, um, you know, I think I think this is also a reflection of something we've culturally seen is this like f- fiercely independent and I'll say um, cascading level of personal accountability that people want to take for things where oh, I just want what I want individualism if you will yeah like yeah. oh I just want what I want and I want for me and you know all this other stuff outside here that's not as important to me I- I'm caring about what what I want for me and what I want for my life and we've talked on this show at, a lot about millennials and Gen Z looking for flexibility of time freedom yes. flexibility of money freedom yeah. which are all part of a, a, the personal freedom of individualism and so I think that part of this is a cultural shift as well from these foreign wars if you will from the baby boomer generation uh, whose parents came out of things like the World War II uh, into into the baby boomer generation from 1946 to 1964. And that's a huge, huge uh, population that had a, a completely different worldview yeah. than we do now with Gen, Gen yep, Z. 100%. And then, I mean, that's also why for them, you see preserving democracy because that, that was the biggest theme back then. <clears throat> you know, everybody was fighting for, you know, democracy. Everybody was fighting for, like, you can't go communist, don't go red. But if you notice, the younger generations preserving the democracy is a lot lower. Well, and uh, yeah, and I Gen think, X and baby boomers have it right there next to each other. As an older person, I'll also tell you that the definition of what that means has drastically changed in the last four uh, and eight 100%. years. So there's there is the, there is absolutely something to be said about what that used to mean versus what it means now. I guess um, you can argue <laughs> that back then it, it was being fought for what it should have been whereas now it's just muffling between like oh democracy is this well the re- there's yeah the redefinition of what def- democracy is right now is not the traditional definition of what democracy was and what was being fought for that is why i think you see like gen x and gen uh, baby boomers both have that in num- the number two spot mm-hmm. that it's right after the economy is preserving democracy because th- those things go together for them is our democracy here at home and our economy here at home affect everything else down the line here at home mm-hmm. and, and i think that that is something that broadly everyone kind of adopted as, as a universal truth. I'll say that lightly. A m- majorly uh, adopted definition, which honestly has changed and culturally changed and been shifted to the left very hard in the last few years. So not surprised to see that at all. Um, we talked last week that Gen Z and millennials took out 40% of mortgages. So if you missed that on last week's show, Brian and I did a whole segment about how um, Gen Z and millennials Oh, you took know what? I haven't watched it. 40... 40- <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys can watch it with Brian. Uh, he just <laughs> we did a whole segment on the show oh, is that, no, about I, how I experienced 40, it. Forty <laughs> percent of the mortgages taken out in twenty twenty three were by Gen Z and millennials, oh, which was re- a really high, per, high so percentage. So interesting. I'm gonna go check it out. Yeah, you should watch yeah, that yeah, show. No, you definitely. were you were on it. Um, I was. Now, part of this also, it, that again, uh, the reason why we've come to these results in this survey, um, it was, uh, how many people was it, 3,000? Yeah, 3,000 people. They conducted a survey in February 2024. Uh, part of it is because of what's mentioned here in the article. Home prices have soared more than 40% since before the pandemic. And in 2023, it was the least affordable year on record. And so by the time you get to February 24, they're rolling out this survey. You're like, man, 2023 was really, really hard. Um and, you know, you only have 26% of adult Gen Zs already owning a home, and median U.S. asking rent has increased more than 20% since 2019. So you have escalating rent, high home prices, high interest rates. You have uh, the least affordable year on record in 2023. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm not too surprised that housing affordability is a top thing for Gen Z. I don't know. I mean, regardless, living costs, shelter costs, renting or buying is expensive right now. Yeah. And, uh, <clears throat> I mean, everybody's feeling it. And I feel like right here where they say housing affordability is a cornerstone of these years, presidential ex- election. Is it really, though? Well, here's the thing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> is it really, though? Yes. Yeah, so, okay. <laughs> Let's stay on topic. What? <laughs> 
I think what we need to talk about to close this segment is we need to talk about what people should be looking for because this, you know at the very end they're talking about oh the, the president has a, a plan for this and then the can, the other candidate has a, a plan for this and a strategy for that. Here's what I think you should be looking for: look for what is being said and whatever that thing has downstream of it. So if you're going to hear someone, I'm not going to say either candidate, but if you hear a candidate say, oh, we're going to put you know, pressure on the Fed to reduce interest rates, you know what's downstream of that? Higher housing prices. You know, <laughs> That might make borrowing cheaper as far as monthly payments are concerned, but it's going to leave housing prices elevated. Uh, if one of the candidates is talking about policy changes or opening up new rules for people who are first-time home buyers, mm. look downstream of that. Well, who are they talking about? Is it people that are identified as a first-time home buyer by time since they last bought a house? Like if it's been more than seven years, in some cases, you're still now considered a first-time home buyer. Or are you talking about people of a certain economic class or of a certain ethnic and or and gender class? Like. Yeah. There's all those kinds of things, too. So pay special attention to what is being said running up to the election, specifically about housing. It is clearly one of the top topics, and they are going to have different opinions, but there might be some similarities. Where there are similarities, you have to look downstream and see what is the outcome of said position or policy change that's being pitched to you when they're trying to tell you to vote for them. A hundred percent. And just know that, you know, maybe, maybe not. It might get, you know done but at the same time just you know plan for what you can control yeah yeah there's there, yeah there, i mean we've this year covered so many different things where it doesn't even matter who you voted for that certain things are just the way they are i'm gonna talk about california insurance for an example i mean it doesn't matter that gavin newsom is the governor of california and our insurance carriers are leaving the state like you can make the argument to us oh if we had a different governor the policy would be different they said well okay you still have an insurance commissioner there's still other things going on within california beyond just the one set policy for this duration of time the insurance carriers are not in a place to maintain their position of solvency while still operating in the state and because of that, we didn't have a lot of insurance coverage by these major carriers, and they're leaving. And, and where, just, sol where solvency is also a requirement to even provide and conduct business in the state of California. So it's a catch-22. And that's still something that, you know, is just one of the crucial things that's happening here in California. Yeah, we got to um, get those insurers back. It's got to be lucrative for them to come back in order to participate. I know a lot of people hate insurers when we, ever we make an insurance comment. Or but I everybody, insurance everybody, comment, like, everybody likes to feel secure whenever their phone breaks, <laughs> whenever the car gets hit, whenever, you know, something breaks at their house. Like, oh, it feels nice to have the insurance when it's needed. Well, huh? yeah, of course, we always like it. We don't like, I don't like paying the premiums all the time, but I like, I, look, it's there for a reason. So when I need it, it's there and it gets my, you know, my car fixed or my, my house rebuilt or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. But the insurance, I'm deciding the insurance thing, Brian, because it, yes, it's important who you vote for, for whatever topics are most important to you. But also, even if you do that, some things are not fixable with just that person. There's a lot of other things that have to be in motion and in concert together working in order for the policy outcome that you're being promised. So do, do you feel that, you know, when, you know, when politicians go up and they say, like, <clears throat> example here, President Biden has, President Biden has released a plan. Donald Trump has a strategy. You know, they're so vague with what they say at times. It's just like, you know, it's more of them selling, oh, I can do it. I can't fix it. I can't. That's why you have to believe in me because I can do it. But they never really break it down how it's going to happen, what they're going to do. And exactly, you know, the the strategy and the plan of attack is just, hey, have it a plan of attack. It's going to lower everything. It's going to be great. You should trust me. Believe me. Yeah. I'm going to do this. But it's never like, hey, this is my step. And then fast forward it actually put it into place and be like hey this is going to happen i look at it this way i have i look at it and go okay this person talking to me on the screen are they trying to get my vote or are they trying to solve the problem there it is now if you get my vote because you're going to solve the problem that's a good way to get my vote but if you're just saying you're going to solve the problem just to get a vote and you don't then you're a big asshole i don't care who it is you're just an asshole Gavin Newsom. Yeah, whatever. I'm just saying I don't care who it is. If you're just trying to say the thing to get the vote and you're not actually to solve the problem, then don't don't do that. Yeah. But here's the here's here's the here's the other side of the coin. Now, let's say you and I are candidates in a presidential mm -hmm. uh, election. Well, why am I gonna tell you my plan? I gotta tell the voters my plan, but I don't wanna tell you too much of my plan or how I'm gonna get there because sense. how could you what if what if you undermine me? Or what if you you come up with some way that may be more sellable to the public than my plan? Ah. So look, I'm not a political analyst, but I'm saying that I know when it comes to strategy, there is some reason to validate selling it super hard versus describing it super hard mm. and whether you're doing it to get the vote or actually doing it to solve the problem. So there's these crossroads where you as an individual have to kind of decide, what am I hearing, what am I being told, and where am I believing this person or that person? So it's not as easy as it might sound.
I'm asking in my explanation for people yeah. to be mature listeners and actually hear out and then look through what's being said and look downstream of what that might mean when it actually comes to housing policy. <laughs> That's my answer. <laughs> wow. Any last thoughts on no, that? No, I'm good. Let's go. <laughs> Brian, you will never guess which generation has the lowest mortgage rates. Then- New survey from Realtor.com. I know you already read the notes to all of our watchers. Uh, are you surprised by this too? Mm-mm. Gen X and millennials have, on average, the lowest mortgage rates in the entire country across all generations. The silent generation, the boomers, Gen X, millennials, and Gen Z. Millennials and Gen Z have the lowest mortgage rates, on average, across all groups. So it's crazy because I, I, I forget that the millennials run you know all the way to 43, and some of them started buying in t- 2011. Because so. some of them are a lot older than you. Yeah, okay. exactly. Okay, okay. But <laughs> but but when I start seeing Gen Z is like, hey, they're you know hitting the 27. I'm like, yo, like okay, like I I, mean, I am getting older. And these past few guests that we've had on, you know, the agents they've all been 26, 24, and I'm like, yo, I used to be the young one in the room. Now I'm kind of like. The second young guns in the room. That's like being that's like being at the senior lawn when there's a freshman on campus. Get out of here, okay? Oh my god, <laughs> you and I are a whole generation apart. <laughs> Anyways, your point. My point is that you know I'm not I'm not surprised because I feel that you know with all the data that's been coming out and that we're now knowing that you know the younger generation is leading the force in taking out mortgages and buying properties. Right. I think that's you know it's it, it's refreshing to hear that because <clears> as a matter of fact, you know, a lot of people always say rates are too high rates are too high but now it's like yo the people that got in when they were you know rates were affordable they took advantage of it and it's showing and here's here's what i want to make sure i I tell everyone in context of our conversation because we're talking about averages which is of course the generalities and there's people who have a much much lower rate than this and people that have much much higher of course uh so for for the gen x and millennials who have who share the tie at the bottom with the lowest mortgage rate it's four percent on average which is fascinating but then at the top, the highest mortgage rate is Gen Z. So your your generation, which is four point nine. I'm millennial. Which is four point bar- you yeah. barely. Yeah. So, you barely. Yeah. Sorry. I'm sorry. You're I know you're straddling that millennial uh, Gen Z. Yeah. I apologize. That's all right. My point is that Gen Z has four point nine percent. So the difference between the lowest average and highest average is 0.9 percent. Now, the reason this is important for me to mention is because we had been doing VA refinances at 2.25% back in 2021, 2020, 21, some, you know, right around there, right? Maybe it's not going to 22. Now we've done some loans at 7.5%, which is a huge 5% 5% difference plus. I know we had a 15 year loan. We did like a 1.99, I think, yeah. three years ago or something yeah. like that. That's nuts too. I remember that. But for the purpose of this conversation, a 30 year fix, somewhere between, let's say, Two and seven and a half is a massive variance in the short amount of time we've had this run up with rates. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But even despite that, the average between the lowest and highest generationally is actually very small. 0.9% is very small because right now, if you had a loan at seven and a half and you could get a loan for six and a half, you'd be like, yeah, 1%, it might be worth it. Mathematically, it still may not even make a difference. That is, let's say, of, of great value in your it may, may not it may not be significantly enough to validate the expenses during the refinance it, it is i mean if you break it down it's probably going to be anywhere between like maybe like 180 180 bucks yeah depending on your loan amount you know, yeah of course amount, yeah so think about it 180 bucks in savings to then redo the appraisal break everything in it it, it it makes sense if like you know you really need the savings but some people are like, hey, well, you know, I could write it out. I'd rather <laughs> wait till, you know, the savings are like a little bit right. more substantial to then, you know, really tack on mm-hmm. and readjust my loan to then, you know, come lower and lower my payments. Cause, yeah. You know, unless you're being smart with it, y- you are going to have a higher loan amount if you tack on your closing costs into your loan when mm-hmm. you refinance. But you could also pay them off, you know, out of pocket and, you know, have your loan amount at what it is. But regardless, your payment is what's going to be the biggest thing that comes down. So as long as you're able to have a savings that makes sense for you, some people have a 1% saving. They're like, that's good. I need that's that saving. I'll come back when I could do another 1%. Other people are like, eh, 200 bucks. Uh, I can, I, I'll be okay for another year. I'll wait till I could do two, two and a half percent. Mm-hmm. And then it's a substantial savings. Yeah. So I feel that's something that people don't know when they refinance that you are able to pay your closing costs wrapped into the loan, mm-hmm. but you're also able to pay them out of pocket like when you do a purchase. Yeah. A lot of people get thrown off because it's like, hey, why did my loan go up if I'm refinancing? Where in reality, you you know, you're tacking in your your closing costs, but still paying lower on interest. Yeah. And this, this so the subset of this is that with the uh, higher 
purchase price amounts that have been seen in the last several years. Also with elevated mortgage interest rates, they have the highest monthly payments. So uh, while the millennials are tied for the lowest mortgage rates, they are saddled with the highest monthly payments of any generation on average due to the larger loan amounts of origination. I mean, that's not like rocket science right there. It's just, it's what it is. Uh, the takeaway for me in this article, this graph is, at least in this part of the article, is that uh, I, I think there's a, just, there's a potentially distorted view, especially online, that, well, it, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's impossible to get a home if I'm a certain age, if I'm young. Well, we debunked that last week. 40% of mortgages that have been taken out in 2023 were with, what, Gen Z and millennials. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so there's that part. Um, mortgage rates are too high. Well, people are still buying them, and yes, this average even reflects that in that generation, the mortgage rates are higher on average than the others. I think there's also something to be said that's kind of tucked underneath these averages where you can't see equity in here, but Mm -hmm. I know, hands down, boomer equity and silent generation equity is substantially higher because typically on hand, on average, they've owned their home for years or decades longer than anyone who's gotten in the last three or four years. And so the equity play may be, it may so far overshadow the mortgage rate that doesn't even matter. And, and, and you know, it's crazy because, like, I, I was at an open house this past week, and, uh, you know, an older gentleman walked in. You could tell he was, you know, either in the boomers or silent generation. And, uh, you know, he's talking about wanting to remodel a garage or convert the garage, have a second garage, but do something with this house, right? And I asked him, oh, like, how would you go about, you know, doing that? Would you pay for it all yourself? He's like, yeah, I'd probably pay for it. I'm like, does your house have equity? He's like, yeah, I have, like my house, I bought it like you know years ago. I haven't done anything to it. I'm like, why wouldn't you use your equity? I don't want to pay any interest. Wow, I yeah. don't want to pay any interest. Right. He's like, and I'm like, oh no no, I'm like I'm like not to offend you or anything. I just a lot of people when they get into these projects, they utilize their equity to be able to leverage you know the upfront cost. So he's like, I don't want to pay any interest, and you know that's something that I notice a lot with the young older generations that it's very 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 tricky when they are paying certain interest, certain payments. They if they don't like the payment, they don't like the rate. They're not going to do it, even mm-hmm. if it's a good good deal, mm-hmm. quote unquote. If somebody if they don't think it's a good deal, if they don't want to do it, they're not going to do it. Yeah. And opposed to generation, like younger generations, they're like, oh, I'll leverage my equity. Mm-hmm. I'll use my equity. Yeah, it's fine. Like, that's money I, I didn't have. Like, I could put that to use. Yep. Same thing, how they're more lenient to wanting to tap into their 401ks, like we spoke about last week, mm-hmm. which I was here on the show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tapping into retirement to pull money out or, or, or so t- taking early withdrawals and then making that it's a lot down different, payment. Uh, costs. It's a lot different dynamics. But also on this next the graph that I see about mortgage payments by generations, yeah, of course, the older generations have such a lower payment, right? But that's because although they had higher rates, their purchase or their purchase the prices were a lot lower than where we're at right now. Yeah. Unfortunately, for you know the generations that are older, they have higher rates, higher purchase prices, and those purchase prices never stop you know leveling down since they started going up. But go <laughs> go back and look at the, look at the graph real quick. Go flip back to the other page. What's super interesting is millennials have the highest monthly payment, yes, and the lowest rate, right? And then go to Gen Z, one bar to your right. Look at Gen Z. They got the highest rate, but their monthly payment is lower. Isn't that weird? That's so weird. That's super weird, right? Because, okay, well, if the rate's high, my mortgage payment's going to be high because my loan amount was high. But in Gen Z, what's, I, don't, and I don't know where this is coming from, but on your red graph right there, you see they have the highest average mortgage rate. But then in the pink chart, you see that their pink bar is the third in line. The millennials have higher payments on average than Gen X, they and they a have a higher rate. payment on average than Gen Z. So somehow Gen Z has a higher average mortgage payment and a lower monthly payment. Uh, sorry, a higher mortgage rate and a lower monthly payment. Interesting, hmm. huh? Do you? I don't even know, huh? <laughs> well, 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 I, well, I know, is I know it, it comes down to loan amount. It's, the yeah, answer is loan yeah, amounts. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is their loan amounts are lower. <laughs> Um, but again, that could be for a lot of different but reasons. Also the, the time in the graph of when millennials started buying to when uh, Gen Z started buying, Gen Z started <clears> buying at a higher purchase price than the lower tier of millennials. So, right. So I, yeah, but yeah, it goes back to loan amount. It goes back price. to loan amount. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Touche. Yeah. yeah. No, no, I'm not saying, I'm not yeah. saying that to, to, to dig at you. I'm saying like, yeah, it goes back to the loan amount. But yeah. what, what, what's so curious is that last week we covered how they're pulling money out of retirement in order to buy a house yeah. or make a down payment. And it, I, I'm, I'm bringing this up because it makes me wonder how much of that is baked into this little pink bar right there where we see this lower monthly average payment because they've taken money out of over here to apply it over here. So even though my rate might be higher, my payment is lower. 
that is super intriguing because we keep talking and selling this idea that there's been this cultural shift and there's this difference of opinion and and you know the younger generations are looking at real estate uh, through a way different lens yeah. than just buy the house and raise your kids and have a white picket fence and live there for 50 years. They're not looking like that. Mm-mm. And even and even despite maybe some, let, let's say, less traditional methods for acquiring a home, mm-hmm. such as pulling money out of retirement in advance, right. it, r- despite that, they're still actually, on average, looking better than the millennials, which is super fascinating to me because they're the newest kids on the block doing it. So, I know. We're, we're, we're calling the unluckiest uh, generation. Yeah, but... <laughs> I think you're going to end up being uh, the luckiest. Uh, yeah. So let's go to uh, CNBC, Brian, where we're going to talk about pending home sales. All right. Uh, bleh, bleh. Pending home sales in April slumped to lowest level since the start of the pandemic. End of show. You guys, see you Thank next you. week. Thank you. Bye. Pending home sales in April fell to their slowest pace since April of 2020. That sucks because that was right after the whole shutdown thing started. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sales were down in every region of the country, but they fell hardest in the Midwest and the West. Great. Thank you very much. And higher mortgage rates had an effect. Duh. The average rate on 30-year fixed mortgage ended March at around 6.9% and then took off, hitting 7.5% by the end of April, according to Mortgage News Daily. So, signed contracts on existing homes dropped 7.7% in April compared to March, which brought it to the slowest pace since April 2020. I mean... That sucks. It's an ongoing story. When we see the market, uh, you know, the rates start going up. I mean, sales and uh, contracts start slowing down. But inventory's been up. So, we've been talking about inventory, too. So, uh, where where, 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 were the active inventory in April of 2024 was 30% higher than April of 2023. So we have 30% more homes, and we have a 7.7% drop in pending home sales. That is bad news. <laughs> that is indicative that so it's the- It's like whenever we get the inventory and the rates are high, hey, well, so the, many people can, can still be able to afford, though. There's only a couple of ways that that gets undone. So even with more inventory, we're seeing less pending home sales go to contract, okay? That could be because of the price. It could be because of the price and the condition. Yeah. It could be just because of the the pool of buyers that cannot qualify. Uh, I've seen a couple of listings where the um, – the what's the, the private notes at the bottom? The What's it called? The notes at the bottom, not not the public remarks, uh, but the uh, the confidential remarks. Okay, okay. Where the confidential remarks say, uh, "This house is is a red tag because the house is old. You got to go to the city and look at what code violations in oh, order wow. to close." So things like that, where it's like, yeah, so this inventory is coming, but it might not be the best inventory. Is my point? Yeah, okay? yeah might yeah, not be I the best it. inventory. Might might need a little bit of work before you can actually close in that place, or you may not be able to close on it in a conventional fashion when it comes to financing. And that might be something that we start seeing a lot because I feel that the people. People that are now like, hey, I, I was holding off till I could not hold off any longer. Now can't even probably list it for you know on the market actually, and they're gonna have to go towards a distressed buyer, somebody that can actually just you know be able to pick up their property, depending on the condition of how it is. Well, even here it says, uh, let's see, uh, Lawrence Yun, for uh, chief economist of NAR, the impact of escalating interest rates throughout April dampened home buying, even with more inventory in the market. But the Federal Reserve's anticipated rate cut later this year should lead to better conditions with improved affordability and more supply. Well, hold on now so fast there, Lawrence. Yes, you can say it on paper that the Fed's anticipated rate cut later this year should lead to better conditions, but it might not as far as prices are concerned. They'll hold steady or go up versus the cost of borrowing money going down, creating infor- creating affordability. The other issue is that the prospect of measurable home price declines is minimal. So the idea that um, home prices are crashing didn't happen, won't happen right now. The idea that you're going to get a 10% to 20% price reduction, I'm not seeing that here. And we're in a tight market where there yeah. is way more inventory than last year. And still, you're going to see a price reduction, maybe 3%, 5%. I saw one that was 7%, but still on the market for over 60 days, which and, is way beyond our average market time. And what I've noticed as well, like with some of the buyers that we have, even when they have a price reduction, it's kind of more like of an opportunity. Like if they reduced it, let me put that back into the table so that I could get that back in a credit. So regardless, even if they bring the price down, people are still over asking to be able to get credits back and be able to, you know, cover some closing costs. Well, right, right. Yeah, they're, they're game. Yeah, they're, you're basically gaming the way the deal needs to yeah. look, the structure of the deal in order for it to get. I shouldn't say gaming, but you know, they're they're moving it where it needs to be in order to meet the uh, the, the requirements of them to be able to close. Um, 
the, the, the real surprise here is that even with inventory going up, that the, the amount of hunting sales uh, went down. Uh, that was, that was actually a surprise because demand is certainly there. Um, I know here in, in San Diego, we still have much more demand than we do have supply yeah. of homes. So I don't know if it's just a function of the rate environment only or rate environment <laughs> and quality of home. Because what I see on the market now at the end of, let's say mid, it's mid-June, okay? What I see on the market now in San Diego that's 45, 60 days old, that's actually April inventory. Yeah. So... I'm very curious to see what May and June bring us because these are homes that I'm seeing, Ryan, they're older. They need some work, but they're trying to go for market price while still needing 50, 75, 100,000 of, let's say, updating or bringing it current, so bringing I'll, it modern. I'll give you an example of a client it. right now that's selling a property, five bedrooms. It's a it's a nice house. It's just not updated. It's you know not kept to the best. I mean, it has great bones. It has great potential. They try to sell it for eight ninety nine. This was when we got in contract about a month ago. They're going through a, door, a divorce right now, so they basically have to sell the house, pro, uh, split profits to them, each one buy their own house. The thing is that they haven't been able to sell it. It's been sitting on the market. It already went through two price drops, 869 Now we're at 850 They got to offer in at 840 810 825 800 Yikes. Yeah. So, <laughs> so hold on. We got in a contract. We got into contract while her house is contingent, right? And the house that we got into Condra was eight sixty five. It wasn't the best, needed a fence. There were some things that were still, you know, not completed, but they liked the property. Luckily, you know, and I think, you know, not every deal sh- goes the way that you want it to go. And mm-hmm. not every house is intended for the buyer. There's always something that happens. And I always like to say everything <clears throat> happens for a reason. Mm-hmm. So in the in the contract, we're, tr- we're waiting for them to accept the offer. They haven't accepted an offer. So unfortunately, we had to cancel the one that she had open escrow mm-hmm. on. She then starts sending me more houses, and she's like, "Hey, in the month that I got into escrow with the other property at eight sixty five, I've seen all these properties that are coming onto the market below eight hundred thousand in the seven fifties, low eight hundreds that fit her characteristics that we were looking at before, but were higher. Oh, no. And now she's like, "Hey, like, what's happening?" And we're like, "Well, houses stayed in the market for too long." Sellers got too aggressive with the price. They weren't able to get it off. They got into contract, probably fell out of escrow. The buyer couldn't perform, so they have to put it back in the market and then start decreasing the prices to be able to you know, start bringing in more traction. What I was getting at that is that we're starting to see a lot more houses start to come down in San Diego, but mm-hmm. that only happens you know, for a little bit. While everything comes back into the market, the rates come down, everybody that could afford affords, buys, and then it comes right back to the same issue. But I th- but you, yes, that's true. But I think what you're describing also is very niche. It's it's that this place needs a little bit of love, right? Right. It, I, I know that I'm kind of projecting here that there are homes that are hitting the market at current market rate, but they still need a lot of work done. Right. But right, that right. is not the majority of them. So maybe we should qualify that a little bit. And this description you're giving me and the listings I'm looking at, yeah, there are right now a lot of that in this like snapshot in time. That is not always the case because as, as easy as I say that, five miles that direction off camera, there's an entire brand new neighborhood being built. Actually, several brand new neighborhoods being built where there's a university going up. So there's a whole bunch of new homes that are on the way but aren't on, on the market right now, right now. So, so yeah, it's a complete <clears throat> just like specific example. But I feel that compared to other markets where price points are a lot lower, even if, let's say, houses drop a little bit, here in San Diego or in California in certain markets, that drop is still not significant enough for you to be able to afford it. Even if it's fifty thousand dollars, GP, you lost a hundred bucks, two hundred bucks off your payment. Your DTI is still shot. Mm-hmm. So I think that sometimes these examples in other markets, it, it it does work. Maybe like you know, like where prices are lower, like I mentioned. Mm-hmm. But here in San Diego, even if the prices come down, the rate and the incomes and the people that are trying to buy still doesn't make sense. So unfortunately, they really have to see a a significant drop to be able to. Afford unless you just have you know a really strong income, low debts. So, what would you say as far as your projection? If you were to say like, okay, April, you know, you know, pending home sales went down, 
what would you what would you say for for May? Do you think they're going to also be down month over month and year over year too? Do you think we're going to see a pickup in June? What what are some of your predictions? So, I know this isn't backed by anything that we have data wise, but what do you think is going to happen? So we're not through just yet with oh well, we're into June now. So I think that you know May also had higher elevated rates for the month. Um, we started barely started seeing them cool down these last couple of days into last week. Um, yeah, I, but you guys were closing deals in May, so. Yeah. <laughs> But that's the thing. It was more on the investment side of anything. So not that many residential properties because of the fact that rates got elevated. Some yep, of the but this is a pending home sales article. So they were, at, they were pending at some point. So I'm saying you're closing deals regardless of whether they're occupied or unoccupied, they're investor but or like primary resident. But we're not resident. closing deals like 10, 20. We're closing like two, three. Okay. Yeah, I understand so, that. So I, I like, and what I'm seeing as far as like the market, there isn't that much traction. Yeah, we still close deals, but it's for people that have strong income, people that mm -hmm. have significant down payment. Mm -hmm. First time home buyers, some of my first time home buyers, unfortunately, have to put the brakes because they Got can't it. afford They're on the sidelines watching right shop. now. So, what but do you think is going to happen in May and June then? Do I you think, think that it, people that have high equity, good income, low debts are going to have the best chances of being able to get approved. If rates stay even under 7%, that's going to be enough. Enough momentum for some people to jump into the market this summer and start making moves. But if you don't have a good, like solid income, low debts, significant down payment, mm -hmm. it's going to be very tough for you to compete in yeah. certain areas if you really want a property and there's a lot of competition. Yeah. So I think that's something that you need to be very wary of going into the summer, really button up everything. Because if you're looking to really get in, it's not going to be easy because everybody else is also They're still looking. Yeah, They're already, still yeah. looking. So, and yeah. then that's another thing that there's people that have been patiently looking, prepared, waiting for opportunities where there's people that are like, hey, now it's my time. But that person's time was already like a long time ago and they're ready to actually buy. You start to find out that if you're jumping in the market, it isn't going to be one week, two week, three weeks, four weeks, one month, two months. It could be a three, four month process. Yeah. And you, know, you could be in escrow certain times and be like, it falls off because of certain things. You know, it reminds me <laughs> of, uh, for those of you who are watching out of the area, you know, on some of our on-ramps to our freeways, there's like the, uh, there's the carpool lane. Yeah. And then there's during, during peak traffic times, there's like the, there's, there's a line of cars and there's a light that'll turn green to let yeah. you go and yeah. it's red to make you stop. And the person at the front of the line was there right before you. And there's a lot of cars between that first car waiting for that yes. light to go green and me yes. who just pulling off the side street to get onto the on-ramp and wait for my turn to get back on the freeway. And that is very similar to what Brian's talking about right I, here. I, I think you hit it the nail on the head that it's like there the competition is there and you're just going to be waiting in line because there's people that were already approved for the beginning of the yeah. year, middle, I mean, quarter of the year, yeah. and now going into half of the year. Yeah. And I know, and I know, when it comes to like putting a bid on a house, yes, everyone can be making bids at the same yeah, time. Yeah, I'm not yeah. literally saying that the traffic light is the same as buying a house. Uh, trolls, but <laughs> but the idea is, if you have the intention to buy a house in 2024, get all your crap together, <laughs> get your stuff yeah. together, come talk to Brian, go talk to Will, and get yourself in line, as we're saying, so that when the market does come around and the inventory stays up. Uh, then the you know the, the home that could be pending next is the one that you got your bid offered and accepted you, you, on. You have to be actively looking, like actively looking. You can't just be like, hey, like I'm gonna wait for the right one to pop out. No, you're gonna have to go and look, go find the right one. Yeah, it's almost <laughs> it's nearly impossible to have passive success in real estate. No, at least you can't not right passive, now. You, 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 well, yeah, you, you can create passive income. You just can't have passive passive success. <laughs> not right now. So uh, yeah, I mean that's that that was my two cents on. All that. right, all right, got it. <laughs> Okay, Brian, America's top 10 buyer's markets where you can still land a bargain below the asking price. Um, there are 10 places listed here. Uh, but before we get to them, I want to talk really quickly for people who might be watching our channel for the first time. Let's let's use the article's definition of a buyer's market because there's some misconception around what defines a buyer's market. Uh, to pinpoint a buyer's market, Realtor.com economists searched for metros with a low to sale, a low sale to listing price ratio. This means that areas had homes selling for the lowest price relative to their initial listing price. That's very important. Now, uh, buyer's markets are a product of high inventory levels and often slowing time on market, explains Realtor.com economist Hannah Jones. When buyers have more options, homes sit on the market longer and sellers are more likely to compromise to move a home sale along. So just because a buyer's market, it's a buyer's market doesn't mean that prices are lower. It just means that sellers will be more eager to meet buyers halfway by either lowering their asking price or offering concessions such as a mortgage rate buy down to sweeten the deal. Andy, you can still get a bargain for a house at, in the Keys. D well, here's, okay. <laughs> so let's... <laughs> Immediate hard pivot to the list. Uh, buy, so buyer's market, first and foremost, means it doesn't necessarily mean that the prices are 
lower. It just may mean that the terms and conditions may be more favorable where the seller doesn't completely have 100% of the uh, deal weighing in their favor and they need to meet you closer to the middle in order to strike an agreement on what would actually go to escrow. Uh, I liken this to uh, the um, teeter-totter on the playground where one person is significantly bigger than the other and um, they just are sitting like sitting on it and well you're, you're just stuck up there while they're sitting down on that thing. That's a seller's market. <laughs> Buy, buyers, buyer's market looks more like an evening out of that if you if you will. Uh, so really briefly here, three of these top 10 are from Florida. Yeah, I noticed that. And I was Another, surprised California wasn't in there, but then again, well, again. No, no, there's one. They're, they're, so, yeah. so three are from Florida. We have three of these top 10 are in Tennessee. And there is one in California. Sonora, California came in at number seven. Sonora. So there's just one in California. But number, so let's go in order. Uh, so the number one, quote unquote, buyer's market is in Florida. Palataca. The second one is in Florida. Key West. Number three, Colorado. Number four, Tennessee. Five, Tennessee. Six, Georgia. Seven, California. Eight, Tennessee again. Nine, Oregon. First Oregon sighting. And number 10, Florida. Here's what's interesting to me. Not noted. Yeah, surprise, not surprise. Not noted is Arizona, mm-hmm. Nevada, Texas, uh, Idaho. Remember, Idaho was like so many people were fleeing to Idaho a couple of years ago. Yeah. Um, Boise. Now, and here's why I'm saying that is it, um, because that is obvious. Yes, it's going to drive prices, but that it, it 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 just as quickly as it ramped up, it also seems to kind of cool yeah. down. Yeah. So I thought. I thought for sure, you know, just judging, I was like, oh, we're going to see Idaho on here somewhere. We didn't. That which is, which is very curious to me. But maybe that just means Idaho is still going way more stronger than I, I perhaps, believed. Perhaps. That's, that's obviously what it means in his in this case. So, um, what what was what, what surprised me here? Um, I'm going to just point out the Key West one that you mentioned earlier. So Key West number two median <laughs> median list price is still 1.3 million dollars. Yeah. <laughs> but you, well, you see what I mean? Buyer, if, you, if, you have market, the, if you have that income, dude, that's a good deal. <laughs> buyer's market for $1.3 million, Key West, Florida, everybody. There's a buyer's market. But And, and then well, here's the funny. Right after that, Breckenridge in Colorado, $1.1 million. So there's another uh, north of a million dollar. And those are the only two on this list that are north of a million dollar for the quote-unquote Top 10 buyer's markets in the United States right now. So that's ridiculous because then you're meaning <laughs> to tell me like low end, like starter homes, like you're, like you're probably like 500 to 600, 700. That's ridiculous. Well, I mean, it says it right there in Breckenridge in yeah. number three. It says, you know, uh, da, 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 uh, okay, have you, Breckenridge has a home base, home achieved. The average home list price rings in about $1.8 million, but it's possible to still find a sweet cabin for less than 500 Hey, 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 hey. R- notice those words that they use, sweet, sweet cabin. cabin. I want to see what that's. Yeah, but cabin Breckenridge, like. Breckenridge is beautiful. <laughs> If you, have, if you uh, don't know about Breckenridge, I, I, I don't know. So say no. Breckenridge is be- <laughs> Breckenridge is beautiful. To that, be honest, I've heard maybe like three of these. These uh, uh, that's fine. Cities. That that that's fair. Yeah. That's fair. You still have all your hair, and you're under your thirties. Uh, yeah, Breckenridge <laughs> is a, is a beautiful place, actually. So the fact that you can get a cabin for Breckenridge in Breckenridge under five hundred thousand is right. is well, awesome. Oh, okay, then t- that's what I'm more to my point. Great yeah. deals, guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, d- and, d- and, d- and, and, and even despite them referencing that you can get a cabin for under five hundred thousand, the medium price is still one point one. <laughs> One point one million, that's nuts. Um, so, okay, takeaways here is there are parts of the country where it is looking like it's a buyer's market. It may not be in the market you want to be in, but the reason I picked this article today and wanted to talk to you, Brian, about this is that we have spent a substantial amount of time talking about how people are looking at real estate for the long haul and as an alternative for long term growth, long term return, and for making money. And having cash flow and having flexibility of travel, movement, and time and of money. Right. In this example, I I brought this up because of the amount of millennials and millennial related articles we've talked about recently, where people are buying outside of the place they live right now. Right, right, right. And they work right now, but they're buying a place to Airbnb. They're buying a place to have as a long-term rental. Some more, uh, they're having a place to go retreat to. You're having a place they can put on a midterm lease or something. Yeah. And I believe that even in some of these places, this could be a this could be a spot. If you're if you're in and around the radius of these cities here on this top ten list, link in the description box, then this could be a great place for you to pick up your first property. Mm-hmm. So that's my long long point. Short is 
you're looking to get in the housing market. You don't really, you, maybe you can't afford to buy a place in the exact city that you live in right now. But if this, if one of these cities is near you, you might be able to go to a place over here. And you know, if you didn't know when you're buying a multi, uh, when you're buying a rental property, you don't need to use your personal income. You're able to utilize. You're able to <clears throat> utilize the income that is derived from the property. There is products out there like a DSCR loan that you know will help you basically in the simplest term. If your mortgage payment is covered by the rents, then you have a good chance of that loan being approved. Now, there's a lot of you know stipulations and a lot of more details that go into it, but that's the reason why you should be out there, you know, seeing what these properties look like, running your numbers, you know, really calculating everything because. If the numbers make sense, it's not like a traditional residential loan where you have to go through underwriting, fit the box, have the credit, this and that. No, numbers talk. And if the numbers make sense, the risk is mitigated, the bank says, hey, this is a good deal, we will lend on it, you're going to be able to purchase that property, although it is going to take you to put some down payment in, you're going to be able to control that asset and be able to use that as a leverage point for you to do whatever else you want to yeah. do. If you if you are hearing this for the first time and you heard the ter- the acronym DSCR for the first time, it's debt service coverage ratio. ratio. Yeah. So that's short so debt service coverage ratio is a loan type called DSCR where the payment against the property and all the costs associated with owning that property are matched against the market income of that yes. property. And so it is not just you qualifying. It's basically the property qualifying itself to the eyes of the underwriter and the lender. Yeah. Um, so in this case, if you are one of these people I'm describing where you're like, oh, I don't live in Greenville, Tennessee, but I live around Greenville, Tennessee, and I can't buy in the place I live, but Greenville's you know another county away or within 100 miles, 200 miles away. That might be something to consider. Yeah, like if you start really looking at the markets that have a lot of, you know, foot traffic, that'll have, you know, people coming in from different areas of the state, that's the type of areas you want to start paying close attention to. See how the business is running, see how much growth is happening in those areas. Mm-hmm. And if you do see that there is going to be, you know, growth down the line, there's a lot of expansion, business are coming in, people are moving in, then that's, you know, good signs that maybe it's an it's an it's a market that you want to look into, maybe potentially invest in. And like I said, all you need to do is run your numbers connect with your local lender reach out to us we can help you out in all 50 states but the biggest thing is taking action but taking action with the right tools yeah i would say if uh if we're describing you in this little segment of the show i'd say look for three things i wrote these down here number one look for migration patterns are people moving to this area that might be a good thing to look at number two are there new businesses or industry moving into that area is there a dedicated space of land that's going to be for X, Y, Z purpose? And that will draw to it employees and lots of workers yep. and their families. And then the third thing is tourism. There yeah. are some places where they are like, um, they're, they're, they're kind of, they're, they're, Maybe their tourism was low or there wasn't much of one, and now there's become one. That, I think that's something to also look at, especially when it comes to short-term rental or even mid-term rental too. Uh, so look for migration patterns, look for new business or industry cropping up, and look for tourism opportunities. I, honestly, that last one, the tourism, <clears throat> you literally hit the nail on the head. I feel that right now, uh, with everything happening in the world, people still want to go out and experience. But there's so many stuff that you could do here within the, the United States that like, I find myself looking through social media and saying, hey, I didn't know that existed here. I know. You, you, there's so many places, Andy, and I speak to Michelle about it. Hey, babe, we got to go visit here. We got to go visit here. And they're all here within the United States. And I feel that, you know, after COVID, people really have this yearning for experiences, right? Yep. But we also have that, that bad feeling thought in our head of like, hey, leaving the area, leaving the country sometimes isn't probably the best when everything's <clears throat> happening right now. But people still want to experience. And I feel that in the United States, we have so many little gems and communities, so many little places with so much rich culture, so much to offer, so much experiences that there's literally like a playground for investors to start, yeah. you know, going out and finding these places. But I think it's that taking the time to really just analyze what type of investment you want, the area that you want to hyper focus on yeah. and really just embedding yourself and, you know, owning that space. Yeah. The, the United States is so vast. It is. And it really is. And, and again, I, again, I don't know about each of these little 10 cities that are I don't mentioned. know I don't half know, of these cities. I don't know a lot about them Three at all. Three quarters of them. The, the, but the, the takeaway is that if you're looking to get into real estate, there are places where it's like, it's considered in this yeah. In this agreement or in this article, they're they're considered buyer's market, buyer friendly right now. Yeah. There's probably eleven number eleven through twenty, whichever ones those are. Those are probably friendly too. Yeah. Let's be honest. <laughs> I mean, the, you know, the top ten sounds good because it's an easy to make a top ten list. But I mean, you could probably take the top fifty most friendly places right now, I mean, and they're still going to be beneficial to most people that are looking to get a place. There. I know a lot of people travel out to Panama City. Yeah, in Florida. Yeah, Florida. Uh, so I, I know. Mean, do I do j- just. You know, just recently, I, I I left San Diego to go on a trip. I had a layover in Houston. Then I was mm. in Pensacola. Then I was in Alabama. And it's like I just hit three, well, four states in Colorado. I was in four states. 
uh, four, four states in 24 hours. <laughs> And I think, uh, um, you know, I once you start, I mean, I never travel outside of the United States, you know, but they do say that, you know, the United States is one of the biggest countries because of, you know, how much land we actually cover yeah. as a whole. Yeah. Whereas you go to other <clears throat> places, your country is very small. Like, you know, it's right. like a city size. Like, you know, some depending. of our states are the size of countries. It, yeah, exactly what I mean, where it's like, you know, you really don't have all these things. We're, we have mountains, we have desert, we got oceans, yeah. we got we got it all. <laughs> so come on down to the come United on. States, <laughs> where dreams come true. There's no one watching out of the country. <laughs> um, uh, all right, Brian, you walk through the front door. No, let's let's get to the end here. What was your favorite part of the show today? Uh, you know, seeing uh, the young generation really honing in, and uh, you know. Taking that forefront, you know, taking on debt, being able to, you know, be smart about the investments that they're making. And I really, really, really was surprised. And I really appreciate the fact that all generations across the board were dead on the same thought pattern economy and housing. Yep. I mean, at the end of the day, guys, that's the thing that moves our needle for yeah. anybody down the line. If you don't have that, then a lot of everything else becomes second because yeah. that's the biggest thing that you know holds everything together and and quick note at the end because it's the same thing for me the answer is the article talking about how important housing affordability yeah. is and the economy uh big surprise from the dork in the corner uh but it's because of this isn't housing affordability just doesn't mean getting a mortgage it means your rent having shelter over your head we clearly have a housing affordability problem whether you're a renter or you're an owner yes so for the vast amount of Americans to say that it is the top or close to the top priority is of no I surprise. And also, I would argue that as you get older, you see housing uh, scarcity. Um, or sorry, as you get younger, housing scarcity or um, there's, what's the word? There's, there's, well, there's, there's a word for when someone's uh, un, uncertainty. Well, uncertainty. Yeah. Having housing uncertainty when you're younger, um, you may have a lot more time to catch up into that. But if you have housing uncertainty, that's a big problem for you. And to follow up to that, once you start renting and you start paying your rent, you know it's expensive. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you've heard the term uh, food insecurity. Yeah, right. So I, I think of it that way, like when in terms of like housing insecurity. Yeah, older generations may not have as much housing insecurity because they have a house they own it for a long time. Yeah. They're they're in the game, if you will. But even for people renting, they're. There's a lot of people right now that have housing insecurity. I think it's a big deal, and I'm I'm not surprised that it's a top topic. But I'm really glad that everyone kind of agrees. The eco it's the economy, stupid. Yeah, yeah. There it is. That's We're it for me. It's the economy, stupid. That's the end of it. It's the economy, stupid. Thanks for joining us on the Mortgage Heroes Weekly Podcast. Remember to also check out our playlist, the Friends of Mortgage Heroes, where myself, Brian, and Will interview our friends in and around real estate and how you can win in mortgage and real estate. We talk about a lot of things on that show that are super awesome. We've so had some much. amazing stories, even from our friends we've known a long time that they just never never share with us or we didn't dive as deep as we had in the past. Uh, so please remember to check out that playlist as well. We have another amazing guest coming up this week. Uh, thank you so much for watching and we will see you again next week. Bye guys. Bye.